Here it goes. All righty. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of One Plus One, your place for inconvenient truth telling and myth busting. And we are joined on the uh, show, and we are uh, rejoined by uh, by Nora Loretto, who is the co host of the popular uh, podcast, uh, Sandy and Nora Talk Politics. She is a longtime author, she's a union activist, and, and a longtime commentator on all things Canada. From feminism to uh, to 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 the the pandemic, and she has a couple of books coming up, which we're also going to be talking about. And she's also an uh, abolitionist. and And let's get into it. So, first off, Miss Loretto, thank you so much for coming on the program. <laughs> yeah, totally my pleasure. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a real honor to have you on. And uh, now, this is going to be a bit difficult because of, because 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 my first three questions are related to abolitionism and i know that and as you told me you know over on twitter that like you're far too busy to be watching like a bunch of documentaries <laughs> stuff like that you don't even have netflix so i'm gonna so i'm gonna try to ask you questions related to abolitionism and i'll try let's do it i mean if i can't answer the question i want to answer the question exactly <laughs> but uh okay but let's get into uh but yeah but let's get into it so abolitionism is something that's been like uh i it was you know was was a topic i actually i actually accidentally like stumbled into i never even thought that i would that, that i would even have like several shows with fantastic people like you know l jones bernina haynes uh even you know you know yourself and desmond cole and talking about the the idea of of a police free world yeah uh i'm very much open to the i'm I wouldn't say I'm a belief like I, I wouldn't say I'm a believer in abolitionism, but let's just say I'm far more open to the idea, especially having read now several books of you know Andrea mm -hmm. Ritchie and so forth. But mm -hmm. the one thing which uh, I guess the one thing which which always makes me think that that the police are still to use the that the police are still a necessary evil is is when it comes to you know the very th when it comes to the topic of serial you know when it comes to the topic of serial killers and yes. i guess before i guess but bef before i ask a follow-up question on that how would you respond to uh to your typical ndp -er, your typical liberal your typical tory or people who don't even subscribe to any of that but say that like no like like listen i know that the police have done a string of atrocious things. I know they engage in state terrorism, blah 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 blah, and so forth. But we still need the police because of serial yeah. rapists, serial killers, serial yeah. uh, pedophiles, all of the above. Yeah. So, so, what would be your response to that? I mean, police don't stop any of that, right? We have we live in a society with cops, and we've got serial killers, right? Like, if we had no serial killers, and we had cops, and there was a society that had no cops and tons of serial killers, I'd say, Yuri, that is a good argument. But, actually, 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 wait, wait, say that again, say that again. So if we had a, uh, yeah. If we had no serial killers in our society, but had cops, and we could look at a society that had no cops and was full of serial killers, then I'd say maybe, maybe that, maybe you're onto something. But, but that's, that's not how this works, right? Like the, the most heinous and horrific crimes are not prevented by police. They are at best managed by police and a justice system and they're poorly managed, right? So we can talk about all of the, the, the steps within society that society, society has to fail an individual to get them to be the point where they're that violent and they're, that, they're causing that much harm. But we don't stop it before that happens. We intervene after it happens. So the real question you're asking is when you have someone who is extremely violent in society, how do you stop that violence? And you know very well that you don't stop that violence by threatening someone by putting him in jail. You stop that violence by social services and strong communities and intervening with people early on with social services, whether that's health services or or activity services or education, whatever, right? Whatever. Um, and even if someone needed to be isolated from society, we didn't, we don't need police for that. There's a there's a totally there's so many other options that we could draw on to actually manage these kinds of situations. And the problem is we're so conditioned to think police that we say, well, the police would stop it. You know, I think of the shooting at the mosque in Quebec City. 
the police arrested members of the mosque that night. The only reason why they got the guy that did it was because he called 911 on himself and a 911 operator kept him on the phone until police could catch up with him. We don't need police to do that. Right. And that, those, that's not, an, that's not a, a random uh, a disconnected story. That kind of stuff happens all the time. You know, the, the shooter in the Edmonton city hall that happened maybe a month ago, Stopped by an off-duty security guard. It could have been an off-duty anybody, right? Like, it, like when you live in society and we are responsible for each other's protection and care and safety, people do the interventions. And do we need crisis interveners? Do we need people who can help um, manage uh, violent situations? Do we need detectives and investigators? Sure. Why does all of that need to come from the cops? Interesting, but I think the but I think the kind of violence you sort of described um, were were where it would be much better if we it, were, were, were we invest were we actually invested in mental health services yeah. and social services that don't you know attack you know the poor the marginalized and you know the vulnerable but actually helped uh yeah they actually helped people and so forth. I think people yeah. would say that like okay. Uh, yeah, we do need social. Yeah, we we do need social justice uh, initiatives. We do. We, we should have a a society which is based on social justice, racial justice, eco justice, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, the the great argument uh, I've heard, you, you know, came from the former Green Party uh, leader, Anthony Paul, who said that, uh, you know, who said that that there are some people in which no amounts of uh, of socialism and, and you know and good policy will fix them and Sorry, so what do the cops do though what do the cops do in that situation right now what do the cops do in that situation uh they would be well they well <laughs> right, like the, the, the serial, serial killers right <laughs> the biggest serial killer in canadian history was 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 robert picton and the police did nothing to stop him. Nothing. Right. We can see this. Bruce, Bruce MacArthur, same thing. Police ignored the pleas of the community saying there was a serial killer. They did nothing. All of the violence that's faced uh, by Indigenous women, by potential serial killers, the cops don't do anything. So, I mean, yeah, we can say the cops protect us from serial killers. They don't. Um, I think that the question then is not, this is a question we're talking about police. This is more of, a, of, a, of an interesting conversation to have when we're talking about prisons, okay? That, that's a separate issue. But cops, I mean, when the, what, the, what the hell last crime did a single police officer foil, actually? Well, and, 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 well, that's a perfect, actually, that's a perfect segue, actually, to the, to, to you know, to that discussion about the police and so forth, because, uh, because that's, because, of course, that's always, like, the argument that, you, you know, that you face from people who say, who, who only believe in radical reform of the police and not abolitionism, mm -hmm. you know, they'll always, they'll, they'll, they'll always talk about, like, you know, like, serial killers, they'll talk about, like, yeah. Ed Bunsey, they'll talk about Ed Gein, they'll talk about like Charles Manson and so yeah. like that. But <laughs> and I remember doing and I remember doing a show with uh, with L Jones and Bernita L Haynes about how okay, well, let's actually confront that you know that topic head on, the serial yeah. killer. And yeah. a lot of the times the police do no, like okay. have done a horrible job of you know of serial killers and we yeah. and you mentioned Robert Pickton and then of course there's there's also the story of uh uh what, what what's his name Jeffrey Dahmer who was and and he's literally like that serial killer that that they make movies on like the guy engaged yeah. in brutal torture uh, like you know you know like engaged yeah. in cannibalism and so forth like that he preyed upon uh, people. like they all do i mean that's 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 it like you're not gonna fix that dynamic with cops the only thing the only thing that i think you can make a, a reasonable argument is like traffic control right speeding traffic violations that kind of thing even then you don't need a police officer like we're just so police brained that we assume that they do these things and it's like no what do they what what, what are we actually talking about here they mess up 
massive uh, investigations all the time. They're they're they act like assholes in society. You know, I just did on my daily news podcast um, a story of a guy who's who's been charged been, been charged with discreditable misconduct. I mean, like the police tribunal found him to be uh, acting discreditably by getting in a physical fight with teenagers because they were on dirt bikes in a gravel pit. And this guy was like, oh, what are you doing this gravel pit? Like, it's it's bonkers that we accept this within society. And there is no, there's nothing that a police officer does that cannot be done by either someone else or could literally just not be done <laughs> at all. Well, when it comes to the issue of serial killers, so so there was the case of Robert, uh, so there was a case of Robert Picton where the police, like, you know, you know where, where several women and other people were warning the police and they just did not do anything at all. And mm -hmm. of course, the case of Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, he preyed upon, uh, you, know, you know, he preyed upon gay men, particularly, you know, gay mm -hmm. men of color and so mm -hmm. forth. And there, there was the incredible story of one person who, who, who almost escaped from him. And then like, you know, called the police, Dahmer right. catched, you know, Dahmer caught him. Police like go in, they 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 see like his like wounds of like what like Dahmer was like doing, but then Dahmer convinced the police that like, oh, this is just a lover's uh quarrel, and they left the guy who later ended up becoming murdered. Then yeah. of course there were and uh, there was John Wayne Gacy, who also like was like a serial killer, partic uh men of all ages, including you, you know, including children. The reason why he wasn't caught by the police was because they all just thought, well, such and such is a gay person, ergo, whatever happens to them, like, it's not our problem. And it's like, <laughs> so, 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 and then of course, like eventually like John, you know, the guy was captured because like, you know, they, they, they chased some good leads and the guy was just very, you know, narcissistic that he just kind of told on himself. And that's how like the police, like, you know, you know, caught, uh, you yeah. know, got him, but so that's so so so. There's those issues of the police, and of course, if anyone sees the movie Changeling, we know that like you know the woman who lost like you, you know who lost her missing child, the police spent more time surveilling her, incarcerating her, than actually trying to find a kid who, yeah, was left to the wolves. Uh, you, you know, the serial killer. But, but then in a society where we don't, but in a society where we don't have the police, what like, I guess if you, I, I mean, couldn't you, okay, so basically, what would we do then when we do have, you know, you have civil investigators, you have civilian investigators. I mean, why do they have to be cops? So in other words, you would. So in other words, you would sort of like restructure the police to make it into a place where like, okay, if it, yeah. So yeah. Uh, explain you know, more. People want to do research. People love doing investigations. Like you take the gun out of their hand and the position of cop. And all of a sudden you're attracting a totally different kind of person to this job who is doing investigations. I mean, we, we need to have some sort of investigative role within society to discover certain things, right? It doesn't have to be cops. It doesn't have to be cops. And so I mean, this is for me, like, it's just like a crisis of imagination that we can't imagine someone else doing this kind of work. And when you look at like, especially crime scene investigators, a lot of those folks are scientists. A lot of those folks are within the academy. Like they're doing interesting kinds of like analyses and research things, like in addition to the crimes they might be analyzing or researching. It's like saying like all psychologists have to be cops because everybody who's got mental illness needs to be police. So let's just make all psychologists cops. It's like, we wouldn't, we don't need that. We don't need that. And like, and the, and the reality is, is that like that, that social status of being a cop is so dangerous because that is what gives people license to be violent. That's what gives the police license to, to, to target indigenous people and black people and kill them in this country. And so it's like, there's no reform in this. All of those guys need new jobs. They all need to be behind a desk somewhere, not interacting with humans. And then you, and then it's like, okay, so then, then what do we replace them with? Well, let's, let's have a civilian investigative force. 
a civilian security force, a security being like in real term security, like how do we keep ourselves safe and how do we check in on one another and how do we um, make sure that people are doing okay, right? Like we're so far away from actual definitions of security. That's a real con hard conversation to have because there's just too many assumptions built into this that like what we've done makes sense, which it only makes a kind of sense, which is a sense that I reject. Interesting. But then, uh, okay, so... So, in order, so, 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 so the, so, so the, so the serial killer who I, I assume, uh, you know, you know, you know, probably, you, you know, you know, is marred with all sorts of like mental illness. So, so within like this kind of like civilian stuff, you would have like people who do like research, who do the, the kind of like of DNA stuff, but, and, 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 and then base and, and then basically like this large like civilian thing. So that would basically, so in other words, it's cops, but without the, it's not cops because they don't have they don't have the ability to be violent. Right? What is a cop? It's a guy cops who carries a gun. Cops are violent. Right? They're they are they are the state. They are the, the violence of the state. You don't need a cop to be the one doing blood splotch analysis. That guy doesn't need to be a cop doing that. It can be literally anybody else. You know, and this is this is where like we it's it's a it's a this is not just a job, right? It's literally this people are invested with the powers of 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 violence of the state. Yeah, and then right. I think uh, I but, and then, but, and then uh, let's be clear. Let's yeah, be clear. Like you keep talking about serial killers. I mean, that is like such a tiny part of what policing has anything to do with. Let's talk about crowd control, which they're fucking terrible at. As I say, traffic control could be done by civilians as well. They do what else? Investigations into theft? No, they don't even do that. They don't even stop theft, which we already know, right? As people are seeing, like, you know, you know, if you've ever have, if you've ever reported something stolen to police, it's a waste of your time. What do they do? Traffic, like construction control? Okay. Like <laughs> it's like get a crossing guard. Pay crossing guards eighty thousand dollars a year and get them professionalized in traffic management you know it's 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 nuts it's actually nuts right and and this idea that like we need a violent state security force to be the first person that shows up when someone's in mental crisis or be the first person that shows up when someone's getting beaten up by their husband that's nuts there's there's so many other ways that we can deal with that stuff but then but what would you say to somebody who says that uh, who says that okay well why can't we just restructure the police in which in which they don't in, in, in which all of that money that they're you know that's that, that gets poured on them mm. that you restructure the police you can actually defund the police to make sure that they really only go after the robert pictons of the world the, yes. the, the jeffrey Dahmers. never of the world. will we live in a colonial society the colonial the history of policing in this in this country is racist and colonial you cannot reform that. Literally cannot reform that. Right? Like we're like how many police officers are the sons and grandsons and great grandsons of cops? Just like any other industry in Canada, right? Like it's very, we're very provincial people, right? And you cannot reform that. And then why would you even try? What what is the what what about policing do we want to keep if we're talking about reform? Because I've never heard anything where I'm like, Okay, yeah, that would be hard to replace. It's well interesting, but uh, but 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 but, 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 but some would say, and uh, and but, 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 but some would say that uh, that our education system was founded to be, you know, classist Correct. and colonial. Also needs to be completely changed, <laughs> and that and, and and that welfare services and whatnot were also founded to be like classist yes. races but you don't believe in like completely like abolishing that so you, i mean like you and oh and i i think that leftist. it's really it's really hard to think about how to fix the school system without thinking about abolition to be honest but unlike policing i can give you examples of how the school system is good <laughs> right like there's a lot of bad in the school systems but there's a lot of good stuff that happens within the school system as well i can't say the same thing about policing and, and 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 you could say the same thing with, with when he, when he, even it comes to the idea of like welfare and like child services. Okay. Child services is critical. You need some sort of intervention to make sure children have protection. Like we that's 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 we know that. 
So child service reform is really sticky because it again has all of the same problems inherent to it that policing has. And so there abolition is an important conversation as well to see what could possibly replace child services. But again, there still are positive reasons for having child services intervene with people. They say they do save some lives. Policing? Okay, interesting, interesting. Because I think like uh, no, but that actually, but but that's an interesting point that you make. Uh, but I think some people are still thinking that like that. Well, yeah. I mean, what would you say to the people who say like, well, how come you can reform all of that, but you can't reform the uh, police? Uh, even there's nothing to keep. There's nothing to keep a part of it. You know. Child services is an interesting one because it is, it's also very specific to local contexts. And there has been a lot of work done to try and make it more responsive. And it's still a disaster, right? Like, I, I mean, my interaction with child services is I've had a complaint made against me. And so I've gone through that before, um, but that's it. And it was a vexatious complaint. So I didn't really face much risk, right? But again, there they it serves a role that I don't know what else, like there's parts of it that can be maintained. There's, what do you want to maintain in policing? That's my question. You're like, what about policing needs to be maintained? What What about what cops do is helpful? Uh, well, I think we can segue that into what to do about organized crime, like, you know, like the mafia and so forth like that. And sure. I think, although... I mean, although, you know, if you ended the discredited prohibitionist drug war, that would, I mean, that, I mean, overnight, a lot of organized crime would be, you know, you know, would be finished. Yeah. But, you, but, but, but the mafia still has more ingenious ways of, you know, of, of engaging in crime, like scamming people, identity theft, which, which, which other people who aren't even part of like, you know the five families uh, engage in sure. so could you so, so 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 how would we be able to deal with uh you know with those folks who do use violence without yeah. uh you know without the police who can at times try to foil them you know fight yeah, I mean, with violence again police don't dismantle organized crime like they'll intervene if someone's shot as a result of organized crime they'll try to um, you know, track down you know, one of the big piece of organized crime right now in Canada is these stolen vehicles, right? So police are like tracking down stolen vehicles. Okay. Again, those, those could all be civilian investigators. And it is hard to know what's, what, what happens to organized crime if we stop this prohibition approach to so much of what's going on in society. Um, I think that there's probably just as much police who are implicated in organized crime Right. And as we imagine, they're fighting organized crime and the black market will always exist in a in a certain way and will always exist to fill gaps or 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 respond to an issue or a problem within mainstream society. And you're not going to get rid of it by banning it or by dismantling it. So, like, you know, even even um, gun busts and stuff that's still all connected to drug prohibition. So. Again, like I, I don't know if that's a strong enough argument to say that they are, they're doing much in terms of dismantling organized crime because organized crime is, organized crime is in everything. Organized crime is in our casinos. Organized crime is in all of our construction. Cops aren't undoing that. Hell, organized crime is in our is in our housing market. Interesting, but uh, but then. But then I, but then I wonder how we, uh, how we can get to us. Uh, but but then I wonder if organ, uh, how can we get to a place in society where we can eradicate organized crime without, you know, without the police? Because it's what well, because because because, 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 because the kind of like because the kind of. Uh, for lack of a better word, the kind of like civilian policing that you talk about, but which 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 yeah let's let's just say civilian policing without like guns and whatnot <laughs> you know people who can track down somebody who's giving you like dodgy dollars who's engaging in 
all the stuff that we associate with organized crime, you still mm -hmm. have to sort of apprehend those people. But uh, but but if those you know people use you know violence and so forth, then how would you be able to like you know like apprehend the them? You're just, you're dancing around like where we are today in a, in reality, right? And it's like, I don't think there's any abolitionist that it's like, you know, let's keep everything the way it is and then just defund the police. There's lots of stuff has to happen at the same time, right? That's the radical approach is yeah. like, what does, you know, let's, let's stop this, this ridiculous uh, prohibitionist um, approach to drugs what 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 does that do to organized crime? Like I don't I don't know. I mean, a lot of researchers are thinking about this and, and whatever, but does it go? Does 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 part of it disappear? But again, it's not as if police like policing is not stopping that. It's not like you know we defund the police tomorrow. We have no cops. Then all of a sudden, organized crime takes over our cities. I mean, that's not how it works. There would be there is an interplay between the two, but you know, we're talking about utopias here. And so if we're talking about utopias, I'm not going to start by talk like by talking about defunding the police only and not also these other things that that would stop something like organized crime. But you know, there's also like there's financial regulators, there's other kinds of instruments that can be used to try and identify money laundering or counterfeits and all this kind of thing that again can be done by civilian forces, by civilian groups, by civilians, right? I mean, regulation, regulators, there's an enforcement part to regulation, but, you know, cops don't show up to the workplace when someone's killed on the job. I mean, they might just because they show up to everything, but we have civilian workplace health and safety investigators, and they're dealing with what is effectively a murder, right? We have we, you know, all the regulators within long-term care who go in and do the inspections, they're not cops. So then, so, so I think in order to, that I think, you know, probably like, so, so I think if I, if, if I understand you correctly, we can get to a place where, where we deal with a lot of the problems that face, uh, uh, so, you know, you know, society, when people mm -hmm. talk about defund, you know, when people talk about defunding the police, they're saying, okay, if there is so much crime going on, and there, and and we do, and we, and whether it's, you know, people who engage in, you know, people who who engage in substance abuse, or people who uh, are having, you know, mental, you know, people who are having mental health problems, and they're taking it out on, you know, loved ones and whatnot. Or all of those ish, or, or 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 the stuff that we associate with organized crime, or even pe or or even just the run of the mill, you know, con artist that has uh, that has conned somebody out of their savings and whatnot. Oh, we yeah. actually like. We, we, in other words, we we really don't need the police for that. There, there, there. There's lots of like civilians that you know that can do that we as a society can band together to track the person who's done that, uh, you, you know, who, you, you know, you know, who's done that crime and whatnot uh, and, and whatnot. Yeah. And like think of grandparent crimes, right? Like these, these extortions that, that people are posing as grandchildren to, to grandparents. If elderly people had more contact with, you know, service agencies that were like, be on the lookout. These are the questions you need to ask call us anytime if you want us to hear the voices and you know whatever some sort of direct con you you would fight that a million times better than saying oh the cops intervened when this woman lost three hundred thousand dollars already which is gone because it's in another country right like yeah it, it's just about community and it's about how we relate to one another and uh we rely on the police to do a lot of proxy work Whereas the reality is, is the direct work is the more important piece of, 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 of what we have to be doing. And it really does, I think, it, and I think uh, that well, that sort of answers actually a lot of my questions and uh, uh, didn't even have to bring up those uh, Netflix documentaries I wanted you to watch. <laughs> there you go. Because <laughs> it's sort of like, cause, okay, because because I, th I think that sort of like answers then like, you know, a lot of like, you know, like my concerns about well, yeah. what do we do? When, you know, when it comes to this extreme case, I will mm -hmm. also just mention that uh, 
people should watch. Uh, let's see if I have it here. There is a. Uh, wait, where is it? Uh, okay, I can't find it right now. But there was a, but, but there was a documentary. Uh, I'll post it in like the show notes uh, later. And it was all about, funny enough, it was all about you know a woman who was kidnapped from like her home, blindfolded and uh, everything, and uh, and she was assaulted during her kidnapping. While all of that was going on, the police spent more time interrogating her boyfriend, who they thought was in on it. Of course. <laughs> when, of course. When, she, when she was released by her, like, attacker, the police actually started to interrogate her. Them, yeah. along with the media, thought that they were in on a hoax and they compare this to and they compare this to the movie Gone Girl. They even call the couple like the gone uh, they even call like the couple like like the Gone Girl uh, couple or something like uh like that. Eventually a good apple, a good police uh, officer from like another county in you know you know in California mm. you know did some good investigation, followed some good leads and actually caught the actual perpetrator and and you know and luckily like there was no more like there's there's no more legal or media persecution of that couple but in the meantime they went through this huge trauma the woman in the the, the woman in the documentary even talked about how 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 she was assaulted twice before being before this third before being kidnapped and assaulted again by you know by the criminal when she was assaulted by somebody that she knew and wanted to go to the police, the police actually themselves, like this kind of like off duty police officers said that like actually convinced her not to do it because there's no, there's really no point in you doing this because it's going to be like, like that's shocking. Yeah. <laughs> and so I wanted, yeah. I don't need to see that. I don't need to see that. You know, I mean, this is, this your, is why I don't want to shit. that. Like, I don't need to see that. I know that. This is quite, yeah, no. And like, it, it, you know, I mean, it's just... yeah, yeah. Like we, we know that cops behave badly. We know that they don't believe people. They certainly don't believe people who are more marginalized than others. This is all obvious. It's so obvious. And, and I mean, it's good that these stories get told to a mass audience for people who may not have not thought about it or have never kind of connected the dots before. But like for progressives, it, I mean, we have to be more creative than thinking that what we have is adequate at all. And usually when you start chipping at what the problems are, you go deeper and you go deeper and you go deeper and you realize like, oh my God, it's actually rotten right through the core of everything, right? So I, I, I liken it a lot um, often to Canada's abortion laws, which we don't have any, right? And by not having abortion laws, that was the radical position. It wasn't let's ban a uh, let's get a, an abortion permission up to twenty weeks or thirty weeks or whatever. It was no law. This cannot have a law, and that has saved Canada and made Canada the most free country in the world to have to have an abortion. That was a strategic even discussion. Though, even, though, even though there's not many clinics available to. Uh women who want to terminate their pregnancy right well yes and no like it depends on where you live if you live in a city yes there's you can absolutely get an abortion if you live in a rural part of canada it's harder for sure uh the destruction of our healthcare system has made it way harder like but like i'm talking about the law and of course you can you can get the abortion pills mailed to anybody in canada which is amazing but the law it is the, it is the most permissive law in the world because we do not have a law we have absolutely no laws regulating this and that radical approach to 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 abortion has saved us because otherwise there would have been pushing through, OK, let's back it up to 20 weeks. OK, let's make sure that in the, it's only in the case of rape and incest, blah, blah, blah. Right. All of these debates we hear from other countries. And so, you know, you can go for the reform route. The reform route is going to get you maybe some 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 quick victories, which might be really, really necessary. But you're always going to hit a wall and that wall maybe is OK. And maybe it's not OK and you can't have it. Oh. And then, and, and, and then, uh, and then, and then explain, and then, and explain that, like, in relation to the whole, uh, to why, uh, you know, the whole idea of radical police reforms is, you know, is a dead end streets. 
Well, this is because you'll always bump up against the fact that they're cops. <laughs> like, what are you going to do? Have a no dickhead rule to be a cop? Like, you can't. That's literally what a cop is. That's like saying, like, you can have a nice principal. Not possible. The people that get those jobs get those jobs because they're dickheads. Sorry. So what do we have to do? We have to change them from the core, right? It's like, yeah. And, and like anybody that like wants the power of the state in their pocket with the gun that they're walking around, you got to be very, 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 very skeptical of that person. And maybe five out of six of them are not raging pieces of shit. But the one that is, is going to be more than active than the other five in their goodness. <laughs> and it's like, it's like talking about rapists, right? The vast majority of people probably aren't rapists. The ones that are, are raping a lot. And that's a problem. And yeah, well, uh, well, I think, well, one can only hope, one can only hope that we do get to a place where, you know, where, where we don't need, you know, the police. And certainly so many things, uh, you know, overnight can be, solved without you know the police who so oftentimes are part of you know you know are part of the problem but you would never think that just like that, that just eradicating racism uh and and having non-racist police would work or 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 not even... or, or or non queerphobic police and non-sexist you, police you have or... non-flying birds i mean i guess penguins exist but they're pretty rare like <laughs> No, you know, and this is like, you can see this with a lot of indigenous communities struggle with having their own police forces to try and deal with the racism, but the structures of policing remain intact as a problem. Um, and then the racism of the system, which is then to underfund them to, to, you know, people working in really small communities where they're coming up to a violent situation and they're related to the people who they're, who, who they're policing. Right. And so there's trauma all over the place. It's, it's, you know, we have experiments in Canada of alternative kinds of policing and 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 it doesn't work. Now, there are also interesting experiments with like other kinds of security in communities that are not cops. And um, that is interesting where that person also might help someone change light bulbs or see if they're OK. Like like that kind of community care. I know that there's one indigenous community that that is experimented with that. So I think that at the very least, you know, we could be doing experiments like this. We could be seeing, oh, actually, let's totally civilianize our highway safety infrastructure. I don't know. Yeah. Well, well, we have to, well, we do have to fight for a world where we're, 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 we're I, you know, I remember uh, Susan Sarandon like got uh, you know you know got like an Oscar for playing uh, the, the sister uh, Mary Prejean, who uh, who's a famous nun who campaigns against the the death penalty, and she said that we that that you know in her like Oscar speech that like let's hope we can find a way to end violence without violence, an argument against like the death penalty. You can't end and, with violence. Hmm? Well, this is it. This is it. You literally cannot end violence with violence. Like nowhere in the history of the planet has violence ended violence. Literally nowhere. Like yeah. I, but would you say that? Would but, but would you say that about the police that we need to find that that we need that we need to build a world where 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 where, where that whole where that whole where even that whole idea of like brute force is you know mute and that if we actually just invested more in all the things you just uh, mentioned, like proper, like, you know, like elderly care and people looking out for like the elderly proper, like, you know, like investigations in which, okay. A lot of those things that, 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 that we think that the police do the kind of like CSI stuff, we can have all of that just without, just, ju just, ju ju just without the added violence that is with that. So so in other words, the necessary without the evil, because I often say that, like, you know, because I because, of course, people often make the argument that the police are a necessary evil. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, there's no I don't think that there's that's that's it's too easy. It's a ridiculous argument. All righty. And uh, oh, all good. Yeah, I'm just going to walk over here and see why someone's taking a picture of my house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no worries. I'll try to. I'll. I'll. I'll edit that out.
Uh, well, uh, well, if we could shift, uh, well, well, if we could shift gears a bit, would love to talk. <laughs> All good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> what are talking about? You talk, look at the look at the neighborhood. See what's going on. See if people are doing all right. <laughs> all righty. Well, let's well let, let's actually switch gears a bit and let's talk about um, you know, some of the. Ugh, ugh, the you know the internal Canadian politics that's going on. Like, uh, let's actually because what's your view on you know on I I know you're, you're I know you're probably not a fan of Pierre Polyev, but what's your view of like the of the current makeup of the uh, conservative uh, party, and do you think that uh, Pierre Polyev has a chance of? Uh, you know, of waiting if, uh, you know, if another federal election comes about. Yeah. So the thing that Pierre Polly ever is going to benefit from the most is the organized state of the provincial conservatives in Ontario, because Ontario is such a big mass of conservatives and of uh, that party's power that they don't have. I mean, historically, over the last 120 years, those two parties cannot hold Ontario and Canada at the same time. Every time that they have held those two at the same time, one's been going out, one's been going in, and it's only lasted for a couple of months or a year, like a, a transitionary period. And so, oh, wait, you know, well, you're talking about uh, you're talking about like the, the Tories at a provincial level or, or at a federal yeah. level? Oh, so 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 if they are in Queens Park in the provincial level in Ontario, they have not had Ottawa at the same time, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and and it's not just the Tories. I mean, the Liberals, it's the same thing. The biggest reason is because it's a question of resources, right? Their best and brightest are in Toronto. They're not going to be in Ottawa and vice versa. So what we're seeing right now, as Doug Ford is like totally flailing, the conservative premier of Ontario, people are jumping ship. He's losing, um, he's losing like brain trust people to Ottawa. He's losing MPPs that don't want to rerun or that want to run nationally. And that is going to shift the forces away from Ford and towards Polly Ever. Now, obviously, Ontario is not the most important place because, I mean, not the only important place because there's, you know, provinces and territories. There's 12 yeah, other provinces let's, and territories. Let's, let's, right? let's, let's, not, let's not feed into that Western alienation myth. <laughs> no, no, but it's not. It's it's not. It's a question of it's a question of um of the economic powerhouse of the country, right? Alberta only has a handful of ridings versus Ontario. It's, it's a numbers game. And um, if you if you can control Queen's Park, you likely don't have the best and brightest working in Ottawa. And so that's where that's been since Ford has been elected. Uh, and it's the same thing with the Liberals. So now that we're seeing Trudeau faltering, a lot of folks are leaving Ottawa and going to Toronto because they see that the Liberal provincial leader is on the ascent. So I think that we are seeing these polls shift. I don't know how fast they're shifting. I kind of suspect that the next election uh, federally will be more of a mixed bag in both situations because the liberals in Ontario are coming back from the dead, complete dead, whereas the conservatives never got that annihilated. What's working against Paul Ever's favor is he has not at all increased his support in Quebec. And so Quebec is the second biggest province in terms of the number of seats. You do need to have Quebec representatives. Uh, and it looks like he might get somewhere between 17 and 21, which is really not that many. And I mean, even 17 might be hard to maintain because Paul Ever has been nowhere in Quebec. I mean, he's been he's been anti-Quebec. He's been he's made fun of answering questions in French, which is just like, what are you doing? Like Quebecers don't like that. Like, So, um, yeah, it's not. So, I mean, it's. We'll see. There's no question. I, I find going. that strange coming from coming from his his his, his back. You know his background as as a francophone speaker of of he's not. No, no, he's not francophone. No, no, he's not francophone at all. He's. This is a funny thing about Canada is that there's a lot of people with French names who are not francophone, and he's not francophone. He's uh he's he's a, he's from all, he's from all, uh, Western Canada. He was raised by two people who adopted him. And um, Pierre, it's like, it's not Pierre, it's very much Pierre, Pierre Polyev. And, um, and he speaks French now because he has been auditioning to be prime minister since he was fucking 17, but he's not a francophone. So he married a Montrealer that, and that's a big part of his cachet. He married a Montrealer who's an immigrant, who speaks three languages, who's attractive, who's dynamic. 
and they've put her on stage a lot, but he's, he's not, a, he's not a Quebec, he's not a Francophone at all. Okay. Thanks for that. This, this is exactly why we have people like Nora on this program, because these are the kind of like, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Well, 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 I'll, I, I, I'll tell you the reason why, like, I'm like afraid of like, of a, you, you know, of, you know, of a, of a Tory victory. That said, I don't want a liberal victory, like at all. Like I, I hate both of those parties. <laughs> but if, if, I mean, my criticism of the you know, you know of the NTP aside, I wish that the idea of a protest vote was like the NTP. I wish the idea of like people voting progressive was voting NTP, not liberals. But yeah, that's a, another story for another day. But 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 it's funny because like when I turn on like you know like my laptop and I you know and you know and go on the internet, I have like like I have like MSN is like my like internet like provider. So, and I I have my settings in a way that like I can like see like news that comes from like Canada since I cover Canadian topics a lot on one plus one and mm -hmm. and you know I get sometimes stuff from CBC I get sometimes stuff from uh, global TV but uh, but I get a lot of stuff from the National Post and and <laughs> from the National Post and like their like local like Toronto branch. Like the you know the Toronto Post and of course Post Media I think unlike you know the Globe and Mail and and some of the other major like you know corporate uh, dailies, uh, mm -hmm. so far like they're not behind a paywall the way, uh, yeah. So so National Post and a lot and, and 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 Post Media they're not behind a paywall the way like the Globe and Mail is. Don't you yeah. think like do you think that could have an effect though on on the way people vote? Given that, uh, uh, well, given that, like Justin Trudeau, whatever charm he had, it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's definitely like gone. Yeah. <laughs> and Jagmeet Singh, I mean, it's always a, I mean, I mean, it's it's always a far stretch of the liberal, uh, you know, of the NDP ever unseating the duopoly of of the, you know, of the, you know, of the liberals and the conservatives. But Jagmeet Singh, I also find that like the guy just has like no more like. Energy yeah, within him that, that that like whatever charm or uh you know he had is also gone and since there's yeah. a lot of like pissed off people in canada uh a lot of misplaced anger also at the same time uh this is where i think that like pierre polyev could have like this is where i think like you know the conservatives under pierre polyev will have a big like comeback i'm i'm, I'm for sure response to that oh for sure for sure i mean they're also a machine they're a machine and they're organized in every single inch of Canada. And even in places where they are not as popular, I mean, I'm not talking about Quebec because Quebec's a bit of a different situation, but even in places where they're not so popular, like the inner city of the biggest cities of Canada, where they don't win seats, they're still organized and they still have a, pre a presence. No, no one in the NDP, like no NDP uh, 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 group in Canada has that kind of like lock on all aspects of the of their of their territory. I mean, even Manitoba and and uh, BC, the ones with the governments with NDP governments, uh, that was a lot of people being frustrated with the alternatives and not being any good alternatives, and they chose the NDP. But the party doesn't organize uh, riding by riding. It doesn't organize in every inch of this country, and that is to its detriment, especially in Ontario, where the the vast majority of votes are. Um, now the NDP is not even an, an entity in Quebec. Um, they and they can't be. The last time they tried to be an entity in Quebec, they were they were to the the the, the right of Quebec solidaire at the provincial level. And federally, they like talk about federalism, which doesn't really fly in Quebec. Either people are not federalist or they don't care. And if they are federalist, they vote liberal. <laughs> so it's just like not going to get them anything. So yeah, no, that's exactly where we are right now. Yeah, and and and. And do you think that whole myth uh, of the conservative uh, of the conservative party of Canada were uh, because of, because of course like you know like you know like you know Canadians a lot of times like to think of themselves as not anything like the United States. It's the U.S. that has all that social conservative like baggage where you get the worst of both worlds. You get not only fiscal conservatives but you also get socially regressive <laughs> folks. The Republican Party, you know, in a nutshell, but. Sure. But it seems to me as if the conservatives of Canada, slow by slow, are starting to actually like embrace 
social conservatism along with their fiscal conservatism. And, oh. uh, and, and this is where, you know, uh, and, and this is where, you know, like, cause I see like the, the like the Tories have been playing a lot of footsie with the transphobia right. and so forth. And, uh, I think Paul, you have the other uh, day, like they try like their best to like not like engage in like <laughs> yeah. those, uh, you know, in those topics. But 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 very recently, I think like Paul, you like completely was coming out with like transphobic uh, stuff and like. Yeah. And and like, you know, that he doesn't support like, you know, like, you know, like trans women, like having like the same changing rooms as women, all yeah. that's all all that, like, just like boring like transphobic like right-wing stuff and but it seems to me as if like so so so, so yeah in a nutshell it seems as if the conservatives are bracing like social re uh regressivism especially when they de facto did support like saskatchewan and others when they were doing their things of like uh, you, you know of outing you know uh trans and non-binary people and like, do you th do you think that could play a huge role in, in you know in the conservatives making a uh, comeback? I mean, let's 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 go back to the history of social conservatism in this country. So, social conservatives have always tried to piggyback on the conservative party to advance their social conservative agendas. Always, always, always. And in some sometimes they've been more successful, and sometimes been less successful. By and large, they've always had to temper or moderate their positions because they are too extreme. Um, and so that that is a play that has always existed in Canada. Always, 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 always. So where are we now in that dance? Well, you know, the 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 conservatives need organized people, and organized people in Canada, as a lot of our social structures have collapsed often find themselves in religious organizations. And those religious organizations tend to be very right-wing. Of course, not all of them, but many of them are. And so, you know, when, when Doug Ford was running for the leader and he was seen as the outsider against Christine Elliott, he needed the fringe far-right support to get elected. And he went with these like parents against sex ed something something groups. Uh, he gets their support to beat Christine Elliott on the ballot. And then he's just like, peace, bitches, I don't want to see you guys ever again, and doesn't implement any of their shit. So, um, you know, let's, so, and, and people, I, I don't know if people forget that, but it's like Tanya Allen Granich was like a, a person that we talked about back then, and now she's gone. No one, no one knows anything about her. And social conservatives have created two new parties in Ontario to, to run against the conservatives. I mean, they're mostly protest parties, symbolic, but they, but that's where they, that's where they migrated to. And so I think that the conservatives are very like the inner circle of the party are very pragmatic about how they play footsies with these people. Um, when I was at the conservative convention interviewing people about the social conservative issues, the vast majority of delegates were not interested in any of those issues. And, and, and in fact, many said that this is our this is our Achilles heel. This is going to get us fucking unelected. Um, and so, and that would, and they would just, you know, they told us a lot of other stuff that I would disagree with, but I was easily, the, the vast majority of people were like, this, this is not like, even talking about abortion was like, wh why are we doing this? We're just going to lose moderate Canadians. Now the groups that are fighting to ban abortion, like the campaign life coalition, they're also present and they're always fighting and they're always fighting and they're trying to consolidate their support and they're always present and they have a lock on their members who will only go uh, conservative. So it's it's a, it's a mine for the conservatives for votes because those people have nowhere else to go. Either they don't vote or they vote conservative. And so the conservatives have to keep them near, but they also know that this is crazy talk and that the vast majority of people don't wanna hear it. Even on the transphobia stuff, I mean, there were two transphobic motions that came to the conservative convention and Paul Ever did not reference them once in any of his speeches or public interviews at all. So it was very clearly them trying to keep a lid on this stuff. And even the other day, I mean, it was a question from a journalist. It wasn't like this yeah. was like their big policy now. So, I mean, you know, partly though, that means that the work of social movement activists is to continue to fight on the ground to make sure that that these issues don't get bigger support, you know, become bigger wedges for people. And I think that we're having a, a crash course um, experiment in this in Alberta, where the province is trying to use trans children to solidify its support. Now, I personally think that there's going to be a, a very clear limit to that, which is that Daniel Smith is trying to 
provoke a constitutional crisis with the federal government over this because she wants the feds to use their constitutional powers to disallow this law. And then all of a sudden she's got a constitutional crisis and it's no longer about trans children. And she's trying to do this because she's completely untalented and every decision that she's made has been a fucking disaster, like right down to getting the wrong kind of Tylenol into the health system that was fucking like threatening the lives of children, like just amazing stuff. So, um, but I think that when you fuck with children in this country, even if the country is full of transphobes and even if, you know, I, I think that's, that's kind of Canadians red line is fucking with children. And, um, and I, and I note that, that with Polly ever, he made it about sports and change rooms. He did not make it about children, right? He didn't make it about parental consent. He made it about sport, which I think is one of those things where people do have debates like, oh, what if a man did do gymnastics or whatever the fuck people say? Uh, it's not the same as does this child have the right to live as they want to live, right? So yeah, it, it is really, really, really interesting, but the pressure has to stay on from below to make sure that the conservative voters uh, don't don't feel like this is the issue on which they're voting because that that that's a place where it's a disaster where we can't go. Interesting. Okay, that's uh, but 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 that being said, so for people like because like the reaction I'm starting to have is oh, phew. Here, Polly have may not have like the <laughs> conservatives may not have like a comeback in Canada, but 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 the response actually should not be that. It should be more like okay, we got a lid on this, but that doesn't mean that we should. No, not it's it's very bad. Since... It's differently bad. It's differently bad, right? If any Canadian is expecting what's happening in the United States to come here, it will not because it will always be a Canadian version of that, right? There is no Canadian Donald Trump, literally. Like no one comes close to anything like Donald Trump. And um, and and we don't even really have a Canadian Biden, right? Trudeau is an insider, but he's only 40, whatever, six. And he's the son of a prime minister. He's not an insider because he's been elected for a million years. And, and that kind of politics in Canada doesn't really exist anymore. People retire, right? So- um, and, will... also, uh, and, and, and also Canadians are- uh... You know, to you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Al Jones's poem. You know, Canadians are polite. Canadians like to be polite in their, you know, race and stuff like that. The kind of like, you know, like right wing, like the kind of like grotesque, like right wing politics that you see like in Australia, that you see uh, to an extent in Brits. Although, like, although the tour, although like the right wing there is also starting to go like super bad shit. But basically, like. Yeah, in Canada, like no, like like Canadians, even like your right wingers, do not like the kind of like Trumpian right wing stuff, or even like the kind no. of like shock jock Murdoch stuff that comes out of Australia. No, it'll it has to be different. It has to be done in a Canadian way, and it means that it will it will rear its head differently, right? So we have to we have to be very aware of that, and we have to be ready for that. So, yeah. And but. But then I do wonder. Uh, this, you know, this will be like you know, you know, my second to last question is I do wonder. And you have to go at four thirty, like hard stop, like computer shuts down at four thirty. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay then. Okay, well then this. Okay, no, so all right, so so this will be one of my final questions. Is is uh, well. Yeah, I don't know what uh, I don't have a very good, I don't know what to really do about like you know like the left in uh in, in, you know in Canada. I would love to see like an end of both like you know like you know like liberals and Tories, but of course the NDP has their problems. Uh, yeah. but yeah, I still think Polyev has a very good chance of like winning and like unseating okay. the liberals, and it may and it probably yeah, has absolutely. nothing to do with even the whole attacks on like wokeism or. Or you know, or, or or trans rights, but just the level of like discontent that people have, and people probably voting the conservatives as a protest vote. So, yeah. so then hypothetically, if that is the case that the con you know that the conservatives unseat the liberals, where does the left go from there? Because uh, it's yeah, it's going to be brutal because it'll it'll allow the liberals and the NDP to consolidate again which is annoying because there should be too much distance between both of those parties for consolidation to be possible. But we will be back in a situation like we were in the late 2000s where uh, the Liberals, the NDP and the, and the Bloc were the natural allies in a fight against Stephen Harper. It will be very, very, very similar to that. The only thing that'll stop that is if it's a minority government and then interesting kind of polls shift within that, that configuration. 
But with a very strong Bloc Québécois, uh, it will continue to fragment the opposition uh, to the to the conservatives in a way that will actually coalesce that. Um, I mean, fragments it into coalescing. That doesn't make any sense. But you know, the um, it it it. it it, it will it will unite them and it will gloss over really important differences. And so that's actually bad for the left because then we can't have honest conversations about what we really need to do. And then it all gets oriented towards stopping Pierre Poly ever. The other thing where it's going to be very annoying is that it'll be a focus on these culture war issues that are important, but will not be the thing that threatens us the most. And again, if you look at Doug Ford, who got elected on like literally thanks to the culture war stuff, and then didn't really do any of it. Instead, he transformed the health system to be a disaster and sold off the province and privatized and all that shit. That's the that's the problem. And the and and the reason why it's such a problem is because the liberals are just as involved in all that stuff, but they want to have the culture war debate on their terms because they can say we're not transphobic, we're not racist like them, and not have to say oh we would sell that off, we would make that, we would give that to our friends, we would do corruption like them because they will. Uh, and the other reality too is the NDP is a complete uh, joke. I mean, they don't, they don't, they don't exist for all intents and purposes. They do nothing, and um, and a weak NDP that has propped up the Liberals for five years or four years or three years or planning to prop up for five years is uh, is going to make it very difficult for them to separate themselves from the Liberals. So again, the real just question is. Is are we in a minority territory where the liberals win another minority? Is the conservatives going to win a minority, or do they actually pull off a majority? And there's a lot of things that are making the majority really difficult for them to pull off, like having very little support in Quebec. But um, but if they consolidate their support in Atlantic Canada and the West, I mean, then that's totally possible. Unbelievable, unbelievable. But uh, but that's going to be a topic for another day. Before I let you enjoy the rest of the weekend, uh, now the next time I want to have you on the show, I, I do want to talk about the uh, pandemic. I, I haven't gotten your book on it, but I, but, but I would love to have a conversation with you about- The audio book is coming out on April 16th, and I read to you for 23 hours. Oh, fantastic. But uh, but uh, plug also, talk about like, you know, like uh, other projects that you're going on, because you have a lot of book projects going on and people should- uh, so. Yeah. Plug yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, you can catch my daily news podcast every morning, about ten minutes. Uh, the big, big news in Canada and, and around the world that you need to know about. So that's at sandyandnora.com, and then the main co podcast is Sandy and Nora Talk Politics, which is a weekly podcast where we talk politics, and it's a great podcast. You should listen to that. Um, my audio book for Spin Doctors, the book that I wrote about the pandemic. It's, it remains Canada's only analysis on how we did uh, for the first eighteen months of the pandemic, and it's very critical of the government, and it's a great read. The audiobook comes out on April 16th. You should be able to get that anywhere that you buy your books. Uh, independent bookstores, of course, preferred. And um, my next book is coming out this summer, and it's called uh, Canada in Decline, Volume 1, The Social Safety Net. And so I look at the state of Canada's social safety net and how completely devastated it has been and where it all started. Did it start with the pandemic? Did it start with 1995 in the, in the Cretchen Martin budget? Did it start in 1980 with Reaganism coming up to Canada? I go through all of that. And because it is a series in volume one, volume two and volume three are gonna be about the corporate influence of democracy in Canada and the failures of our government institutions to actually represent the will of the people. And so uh, they're shorter books. I mean, they're, they're, they're only, well, 60,000 words. It's not that short, but, um, but, but they're, they're going to be lots of fun. And, uh, and I'm so excited to be able to talk about them to be, with people. Okay. Well, uh, well, Nora, we're going to have to have you back on the show uh, in a couple of uh, months time. Until then, we were joined on this edition of one plus one with uh, Nora Loretto, who, uh, who folks should check out Sandy and Nora talk uh, politics do get uh, her books passed in the present and uh, and I'm looking forward when we, you know when you are done with volume one and when you are done with volume two please do come back on one plus one so that we can talk about it because it'll be very epic conversations yeah absolutely absolutely thank you so much you're welcome <laughs>